a little, I'll give myself a little bit of an introduction. I've been working Please with Ferrite. Been working with Ferrite for five years now, <clears throat> and I work as an area sales manager. So, just a little bit of background on myself. Um, I was first licensed as a ham in 1971. As uh, my call letters back then were WN2DMI. I was 13 years old. Been active ever since um, in ham radio. Um, I work mainly 40 CW. Do a lot of QRP work. I am not what you would call a super ham. I just enjoy rag chewing. Um, also, too, I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm sure there's folks uh, in the audience here that far, know far more about electromagnetics than I do. But I kind of have a unique perspective on it. Um, again, I got started in the early 1970s. And quite frankly, I remember just learning a little bit about ferrite when I took the amateur radio exams. And somebody once told me, hey, clamp this on, on your coax. It's good stuff. And, and that continued on probably for about 30 or 45 years or so till very late in my career. Um, I happened to live in Wallkill, New York, which is the home of Ferrite products. We're probably one of the oldest um, manufacturers of Ferrite in the world. And to the best of our knowledge, we're probably the only manufacturer who still makes Ferrite in the United States. You know, to be completely transparent, we also make Ferrite in China. But we're a small family-owned company. We still do it the old-fashioned way. And at least from my opinion, I'm not here to, to really boost ferrite products, ferrite, but I believe we make the best, uh, the best product out there. So just a little bit of what, what I want to cover today is uh, I'm only going to cover about three slides on my company. Uh, we're going to talk about ferrite as a product, just an overview. We're going to talk about the manufacturing process, how we make it. Um, and uh, the general attributes that ferrite has, some ham radio uses for ferrite, usage considerations, and we'll cover a summary. Like I said, we've got about 40 slides, and I just kind of want to give you kind of my perspective as a kind of a, as a sales guy and also as, a, as somebody who uses ferrite, you know, what I've learned over the past five years. And I got to tell you, when I joined Ferrite Products five years ago, I thought I knew everything. I thought it was probably the smartest and the sharpest tool in the drawer. And I came to find out that what I knew about Ferrite could fill a thimble. There are so many different little attributes of Ferrite that, um, you know, I think a lot, I'd like to share come, you know, some of that with you today. So a little bit about my company. Uh, we're family owned, third generation uh, ownership, all in the same same family. Uh, you'll see Dick Parker here. He passed away several years ago. He was the founder of the company. It was founded in 1952 in Wallkill, New York. We're ISO 9000 and IATF certified. And we've been doing only ferrite for the last 70 years. <clears throat> Starting in about 2000, uh, we moved some of our manufacturing to China, but we still make at least 40% of our product in Wallkill, New York, which kind of makes us unique. We also have a powder production and warehousing facility in New York and uh, Illinois as well. Uh, Ferry Products has about 130 people worldwide. And what makes us a little bit different um, in terms of our, our Asia operation is, is that we're not a joint venture with the Chinese government. The employees, in our China, the employees in our China factory are are wholly are paid by ferrite. They're direct ferrite employees. Uh, the Chinese government has no part of our factory over there. So ferrite is basically used in four different applications. Most hams are familiar with EMI suppression, but we also do a lot of RFID and 10 applications, inductive, and also power applications. I'm going to kind of skip over this, but design, develop, and deliver, you'll see that at the bottom of every one of our slides. And this is basically, if you take a look at our ferrite catalog, about you'll see all the different form factors. We make clamp-ons, we make beads, we make toroids, we make big rings, we make all that. But about 30 40 to 40% 40 of what we make is what we call custom. In other words, manufacturers have come to us, manufacturers of RF circuits come to us and say, what I see in your catalog doesn't work for me. I need something different. So 
we maintain a very large catalog of parts that are custom made for certain manufacturers. And um, yeah, it kind of makes us a little unique out there. Our Wallkill New York facility is our founding facility. It's founded in 1952. All of our engineering is located there, all of our R&D. We have full manufacturing capability. We also uh, have a prototype machine shop. A lot of you guys probably don't realize, but a lot of our ferrite now uh, goes into the automotive industry. Um, and a lot of it has to be custom, custom made. So we have uh, five different Haas mills there. You see in the background where we machine ferrite to different shapes. And lastly, our, our Flat Rock, Illinois facility, uh, which is located basically in the middle of nowhere. That's where we do all our powder prep. We do all our kitting and all of our warehousing. So enough, enough about us. Um, again, last slide here, our Sioux Gen facility. Um, it's probably about twice the size of our New York facility, uh, where it's heavily invested with new equipment. You'll see there on the right side, our 500 ton press. We just uh, added a 750 ton press. We have complete machine. We don't have any machine capabilities there, but we have um, uh, winding capabilities, warehousing capabilities. So what is ferrite? Um, it's a soft magnetic material. So what is that? Um, soft magnetic materials are different than hard magnetic materials. Hard magnetic materials is like the, is like the magnet on your refrigerator. In other words, whether there's a magnetizing force applied or not, it's always magnetic. Soft magnetic materials are different. If I take a piece of ferrite, I wind a wire around it, apply a magnetizing force, it becomes magnetic. It has lines of flux uh, that radiate outward from the ferrite. I take away that magnetizing force and it, it's no longer magnetic. That's what I mean by soft magnetic material. How we make it, <laughs> this is kind of something that I learned when I joined ferrite. I always thought it was metal. I thought, I thought for, you know, for sure it was metal, but it's not. It's oxides of metal, specifically manganese, nickel, and iron. So when I talk about oxides, I'm talking about rust. Basically, we take uh, mang manganese uh, uh, oxides, zinc oxides, and iron oxides, you know, piles of rust, and we mix them together in certain proportions. That's all it is. And we mix it with a binding agent, and depending upon the mixtures of each one of those, and in particular, how it's fired in the furnace, that's how you determine the different magnetic materials. We sell into four different markets, and each one is probably about equal with the exception of, of suppressive. Uh, starting in, you know, again, we go back to the 1950s, and I'm, I'm of the age where I remember when you had a television set and you looked in the back, and there were like little cans and basically they were inductors and these were slug tuned inductors. So if you go back to the 1950s, a lot of what ferrite made was like a slug tuned inductor. It made little screws that fit into like a coil. Each circuit was tuned and you either in a radio circuit or a TV circuit, you optimize the cue of that circuit and you improved your reception. It was typically done at the factory, didn't have to be done again. They put a little bit of potting compound what kind of changed about our, our industry is starting in about the 1970s, along came switching power supplies. And now probably 60% of what ferrite makes goes into what, what's the, known as the suppression market, EMI suppression. The biggest godsend that, that ferrite ever had was the introduction of the switch mode power supply. You know, I can go back to the 1980s. I remember my first 286 computer. Every time I turned that thing on, it would wipe out the TV set, the radio, and anything that was connected to it. We couldn't even get on the telephone to find that computer on. And that switch mode power supply that came from China had absolutely no EMI filtering. And that came, that started our, our whole real industry in terms of suppression, uh, suppression ferrites. And we'll be talking a little bit more about it in a minute. So why ferrites? Um, if we take a look at this frequency chart that goes from uh, almost you know, the Hertz range all the way up to gigahertz range, ferrites can cover the entire range. Um, again, we sell into, say, power magnetics. Those are typically from about 20 kilohertz up just above a megahertz. 
signal processing inductive covers of, of the, the mid range and EMI suppression, you know, the upper range into the megahertz range. So we sell into all those markets. Every piece of ferrite, no matter what the blend is, can be used as either a power core, to be used as an inductor, or it can be used in EMI suppression. It just depends on the frequency. And that's the easiest way to think about ferrite is it's kind of like a variable resistor. At high frequency, it develops really high resistance and will, will absorb EMI. At low frequencies, it works uh, basically as, as a transformer. So again, it's very dependent. Uh, ferrite's properties change very much with frequency. They also change with temperature. They change with a number of other things. We'll be covering those uh, in a couple slides here. We talk about permeability of our ferrites. If you look in our catalog, we've got 20 to 25 blends of ferrite. Permeability is nothing more than how much magnetic force is applied, uh, how, how much magnetic flux you will get give, having a given magnetizing force. So we have some very low permeability materials like our 61 that if you apply magnetizing force will we'll, we'll only give you a little bit of lines of flux. Or we also have some very high permeability materials that will, that will give you, you know, very high degree of flux. If we take and we, we graph permeability um, and we break it into its series, series components, and we call one mu prime, which is the inductive portion, and we get a mu double prime, you'll see out to the right, that's the resistive portion. So if we take a look at a, uh, any given piece of ferrite, it will, it will operate at very low frequencies as a power core. In the mid range, it will act, act, you know, act as an inductor or, or in an inductive capacity. And out in the megahertz range, ferrite becomes highly resistive and will resist EMI or absorb EMI. So if you look in our catalog, each one of our materials will have the, this a graph that looks like this. And this is a rough indication of where the ferrite can be used, where that particular blend. And each one of these charts is different. So just take a look at some of our current offerings and I'll kind of breeze through this because it's, uh, you know, quite frankly, dependent upon what your application is. Make a lot of power inductive components. You'll recognize some of these. These form the, the centers of like transformers. Um, again, if you go back to, you know, if you're as old as I am and you remember, I still remember my first power supply that I bought probably in the 1980s, produced about 30 amps at 12 volts DC, weighed about 35 pounds, probably cost me about $300. I still have it today. It works great. But when I picked it up, it weighed 35 pounds. It had a steel laminated core transformer. Starting in about the 1980s and 90s, switch mode power supplies came in and we're, we were able to shrink the magnetics down. And we started getting very, very small, uh, you know, core, cores that could handle that kind of power. But again, with, with switch mode technology, we make all of these, the bobbins of rods, planars, RMQPQ cores. They go into all sorts of different, uh, you know, transformer designs, depending upon what the designer is looking for. We maintain a very, um, you know, very, standard catalog of these parts. We have a lot of different kinds of blends of ferrite that that fix that uh, operate in these frequencies. And again, we characterize our material by by the initial permeability. Uh, if you look at our 78 material up at the top of the graph, that will operate in the range from about 0.1 megahertz up to about one, uh, I'm sorry, up yeah, 100 kilohertz up to about one megahertz. Our 68 material down at the bottom that has a very low permeability will run almost up to one gigahertz. So depending upon what the, the transformer designer is trying to do, he will pick one of these materials and one of the form factors that you saw on the previous page. Same thing with the power magnetics materials. Each one of these blends, 75 material, 78 material, 77, operate diff over different frequencies. 
they also have secondary characteristics like Curie temperature, uh, some, some dissipate power better. I won't go into all the little details, but what I want you to take away from these graphs is, is that um, something I learned a long time ago, I thought ferrite was ferrite. I didn't understand that we made literally, and, and not just ferrite products, but all of our competitors make literally dozens of blends of ferrite depend and each one operates differently. Some are great in suppression. Some are great in power magnetics. Some are great in inductive designs, but each one is a little bit different and it has different characteristics. So when designers come to us, they look for these materials, which one will operate best in my gift for my given application. So how I can relate this back to ham radio. Typically, most of the people in the audience today are probably looking to suppress EMI or they're looking to build a ballon or something like that. And something I learned early on was is that um, I, my, one of the first ham fests I went to, I, I saw a guy that had a table filled with ferrites. He was charging a dollar each. And I thought this was the best deal going. So I bought a whole bunch of them, brought them home, clamped them on, figured out it didn't do a darn thing because I didn't understand that so much, there are so many different kind of uh, electromagnetic magnetic, magnetic materials out there. I had no idea what I was buying. And so it's very important that if you were looking to say, let's just take something simple, like you're building a ballon, pick the right material. And we'll take a look at that in just a second, what might work best, say, for a ballon at HF frequencies. A lot of you are, again, probably more familiar with suppression than the power magnetic side. Um, in terms of suppression components, we make the clamp-ons. You'll take a look at the lower right-hand corner. You'll see your typical clamp-ons. We make through-hole beads, PC beads, uh, big ring cores, chip beads. Uh, we make it in multi-aperture cores uh, if you're building, say, like a, a, a ballon. Uh, we make wound beads. Ferrite makes all of these components. We make them both in New York and China, depending upon uh, what makes more sense economically. Um, and it, you can see all of these in our catalog. Here's our lineup of suppression materials. And again, um, we'll call it like our 75 material or 73 material. But let's just say you're looking to suppress something in the one megahertz range. You've got a problem, a noise problem in one megahertz range. Our 75 material you'll see by the graph works from about 150 kilohertz to about 15 megahertz. But let's say your problem is much higher. It's You've got harmonics of EMI that are uh, going all the way up into the hundreds of megahertz range. Well, maybe our 31 material or our 43, 44 material works best. That's, you'll see each one of these ranges is where the ferrite becomes high, highly resistive and absorbs EMI. So we make at least 10 different materials that go from 150 kilohertz to over one gigahertz. One note here, we know that ferrite will work and suppress frequencies above or EMI above one gigahertz. But what we can't do is prove it. And the reason that is, is that the current generation of Agilent uh, impedance analyzers works up to about three, three gigahertz, but the fixturing that holds the part during measurement is only certified to about 500 megahertz. So while we kind of know that it works up above, above a gigahertz, we can't actually prove it. So us and other manufacturers will typically give impedance measurements accurately up to about a gig or so. So here's some basics I just want to cover. Um, again, we talked about permeability, and you'll see that all of our materials are rated by initial permeability. I won't talk about amplitude permeability or incremental permeability. These are kind of like little esoteric terms that a lot of design engineers might use, but really aren't apropos to the amateur market. But we can do take a look at, at the, like say a hysteresis curve. You'll see that here. Hysteresis curve is what you'll get on an oscilloscope if you, we take a piece of ferrite, wind a wire around it and apply a sinusoidal current to it. As the current reverses, you'll get a, you'll, you'll watch that core demagnetize all the way down 
you'll see this go on forever as, as, as a hysteresis loop. Saturation is defined as that point right up at the top of that graph or at the bottom where further applications of magnetizing force do not result in further, further density of flux. So every core will have a, a, a saturation density. A lot of times uh, engineers will come to us and say, I'd like to have a core that's infinitely saturable. Well, that's just not practical. Um, most of our cores will, uh, when, when excited under about 10 kilohertz and just with minimal, minimal, minimal field intensity will saturate between three and 5,000 Gauss. Some of the other factors you might, might be aware of is Curie temperature. Kind of a curious thing happens under very high temperatures, depending upon the mix of the material, ferrite will stop working. In other words, it, it's, it's a permeability will instantly drop to zero. And whether it's in a power application or it's in a, a, a um, EMI application, it stops working. It's reversible. Once you take that temperature below the Curie temperature, the ferrite works again. This really doesn't come up in amateur radio too much. It comes up basically in power magnetics, especially in power supplies. A lot of engineers will try to drive that core as hard as they can to get as much out of that as, as they possibly can. They have to be careful. Once it gets above a several hundred degrees centigrade, that core will stop working. Um, typically, long before that happens, the printed circuit board melts anyway, but it's something that designers have to work worry about. There's other factors like loss factor, Q, and power loss density. These are also things that each one of our materials is rated for. Again, it doesn't come up a lot in amateur radio, but it's just something you can be aware of and you can read the definitions of. So again, let's go back a little bit to how ferrite's made. Um, it's basically, we take these oxides, we mix them with a, a binding agent it's then what we call calcine. So I take it and we, we bake it out at a couple hundred degrees centigrade. Basically, it drives the moisture off. Then we mill it. And this is something that I think makes ferrite products, the company, a little bit different than our competitors. We spend a lot of time making sure that each particle size is sieved and is equal in size. And why is that important? It really makes the magnetics repeatable. If you have constant size uh, particles of, of, of these oxides, once it's, it's put through the sintering process, we find that the magnetics are very repeatable. And that is important to our customers. It's why our product, I can be, tell you, is the most expensive product on the market in terms of ferrite. There are, 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 we have competitors that are far cheaper than we are. I don't think anybody has a product that is as consistent and is, and, and it's basically the work that we put into powder. We reject as much powder that comes in from our suppliers as we accept. Um, each one is X-ray uh, is put through a X-ray analysis for consistency. We spend a lot of time milling it to make sure that the particle size is all the same. It's what differentiates us. So again, after that, th these are mixed together. We mix it with a binder and lubricant to kind of uh, works, uh, makes make sure that when we press it, it, it will eject from the, the, uh, from the dye. We'll go through this. We've already talked a little bit about the milling and the spray drying. From here on out, it's basically a, a, uh, a punch press and then a centering. And let's take a look at this. Um, what you see here are, are two different presses. Uh, there's an upper die and a lower, cav lower cavity there. Each one of our parts that we make, and we make literally thousands of parts, requires a die. So when a customer comes to us and says, I, I have this idea, I want this ferrite to be this shaped, and I want this little fillet in the corner, and I want it to be like uh, this big, we have to make a metal die. So... <clears throat> We have those that the prop those uh, uh, capabilities on premises. We make the metal die. We make a sample. We send it out to the customer. He approves it or or doesn't. The bigger the press, the bigger the part. Um, 
what you see there is a 500 ton press that can make a part that maybe is about the size of your fist. Uh, ferrite is typically limited in size by, by the stroke length and the size of the press. We have presses that are up to about 100, uh, about a, uh, we have a 500 ton press, a 750 ton press. We can make plates that are about four inches by four inches, but anything bigger than that is going to take a bigger press. We don't have anything that large and typically it doesn't come up that often uh, that you need parts bigger than that. Anything bigger than that will typically take pieces in and, and, and use adhesive to put them together. After it's punched, it's what's called in the green state. Um, in other words, after it's, it's been put, it's held together with binders and these oxides. I can actually crush it in my hand. Um, from here, we go into what's called sintering. Sint what you'll see a, a tunnel kiln here. That's that opening on that tunnel kiln is uh, that kiln's probably about 35 feet long, runs about 2000 degrees Fahrenheit to 2600 degrees Fahrenheit, depends on the blend. It works just like say a pizza oven does. We put the parts in, depending upon on how big the part is, will be the speed that that, um, uh, that, that conveyor goes through there. Typically the, the tunnel kilns like this are used for smaller parts. That will run through in several hours. Once it goes through, it is it is crystalline and rock hard. However, like if you've ever handled a piece of ferrite and dropped it on the ground, it's brittle. So if you drop a piece of ferrite, it'll drop, but you will never be able to crush it in your hand again. Um, ferrites are really broken down into two different types. One's a nickel zinc, which is fired in air, and manganese zinc, which is fired in a, like a, a nitrogen backfill. If you take a manganese zinc ferrite and you, you do it in regular air, it'll basically rust over. So um, we usually use a, a nitrogen backfill in, in, these, in these furnaces uh, for, for the manganese zincs. And finally, once it's, uh, once it's been fired, we'll do some post-processing. It's got really sharp edges on it, so we'll burnish it. Nothing more than a big vibratory drum that has uh, burnishing media in it. Depending upon how sharp the edges are, the thing will tumble for hours. Sometimes we have to grind a gap into, say, a toroid. Um, and finally, uh, some parts are coated to provide a dielectric um, or an insulation capability. We have all those capabilities in-house. So a little bit more about ferrite um, and where it fits into the electromagnetics and you know the magnetic materials. Most permeabilities for ferrite materials are between 10 and 15,000 perm. Permeability in ferrite is consistent because of our particle size um, and it's continuous. In other words, I, a lot of the powdered ferrites uh, are, are, are powdered magnetic materials are basically little bits of, of magnetic suspended in like, a, uh, you know, uh, suspended in other materials. Ferrite's different because it, the, it, all its properties are consistent along the entire magnetic path. It is 100% ferrite. There's no gaps. There's no filler material. That's what's, what's a little bit different about ferrite. It, that's neither good nor bad. It's just a characteristic. Ferry parts are generally lim limited to being small, less than two, two kilograms. We can't make a huge part because, you know, we have a million ton press, but we can't get anything bigger than that. Um, again, you saw some of the grades we make, you know, we make literally dozens of different grades and there's often large differences in, this, in the magnetic properties. And generally ferrites are used uh, either in the power application, which is just in the kilohertz range, to up almost into the gigahertz range for, for suppression. Other magnetic materials cover different ranges, but that's, that's the range that we cover. Some of the things that affect the ferrite capabilities are, are you know, the losses, uh, the temperature, DC, um, DC bias, and mechanical stress. Each one of these things can affect how ferrite works. A lot of times I take a look at a piece of ferrite and assume that when we talk about permeability at a certain, at a certain level, well, that's its permeability. Well, that's not quite true. 
at high temperatures, ferrite works, it works differently. If you put ferrite under mechanical stress, its, it's, it's uh, suppression capabilities will drop. If I up the temperature greatly, it will reach a Curie temperature and its, its uh, ability to resist EMI will, will drop. Um, if, you know, so there are a number of different external factors that will affect it. So where is ferrite good? Um, typically in, in, in suppression, we're good from about 150 kilohertz up to up over a gigahertz. If you're talking about power, um, we're very good uh, as long as uh, we don't have to exceed about 1,000 milliwatts per cc uh, uh, heating. Uh, it, it can, in other words, we can dissipate about 1,000 milliwatts per cubic centimeter. Beyond that, you're probably going to have to go to a laminated steel core. Um, we're also good because we have a comprehensive selection of core geometries. We have clamp-ons, we have beads, we have a lot of things. That's where ferrite kind of shines. For different applications, different kinds of materials work better. So flux density, um, again, back to power magnetics. Um, a lot of designers will approach us and say, I need a, a power magnetic material with infinite infinite saturation. Well, that's not always possible. Um, in other words, we can probably make something that that saturates very high, but long before it'll reach saturation, we'll reach that limit where um, we'll reach that limit where uh, it can no longer dissipate power. So when you think about it, I'm going to go back to the ham radio usage. Um, you know, again, if I took my power supply from the 1980s, that was a linear power supply. And I unplugged it and I put my hand on that transformer, it'd probably be barely warm. Take your switch mode power supply today that weighs six or seven pounds and has a very tiny transformer in it. That thing is probably operating, that tiny magnetic core in there is probably operating very near saturation. You'd probably burn your hand if you put it on, put on there. So there are limits in flux density in, in terms of what you can get out of ferrite. If you need a lot of a lot of saturation, there are better materials out there. Things like powdered magnetic materials. There's a you know laminated steel cores. There are other things that operate at, at much higher dent. You know, um, it, it can dissipate much more power. Ferrite has a narrow narrow application. It's very good for ham radio usage, but um, it does have its limits. We'll skip over the slide. We're basically the same thing. So let's just talk a little bit about ham radio um, and how we, we, we as hams typically use, use it. Again, probably the most common usage out there is, is a clamp-on. You've got an RFI problem. You take one of our clamp-ons or one of our competitors' clamp-ons, you put it on the cable, and you either cure the problem or you don't. And I can tell you from, from you know, my experience and from you know, the thousands of people that call into ferrite every year, Usually, it's not done on the first try. So again, to talk about ferrite and its EMI suppression capability, the best way to think about ferrite is it's like a variable resistor. At low frequencies, it allows the target frequency to pass. So if you've got a target frequency that's operating at one megahertz, it'll allow that to pass. But as frequency increases and the harmonics of the EMI increase, all way up in the megahertz range, ferrite becomes highly resistive. So it will absorb the EM, it will absorb the EMI while allowing the target signal pass. However, there's a limit to how much a typical clamp on or ring core will produce. Good rule of thumb is it will give about five to six dB of, of attenuation. I sometimes have circuit designers from, from firms coming to me saying, I failed by 40 dB. <laughs> I go, well, clamp-on's not going to do it. <laughs> you know, um, one thing I could I could uh, guide you to is if you do have uh, if you do have a problem with uh, EMI or RFI or whatever, typically one pass through that core is not going to be enough. Every time you pass that that you know, in this case, there's an Ethernet cable there. It could be any cable, any cable carrying a signal. But every time you wrap that core, that, that wire through that, that center of that aperture, 
you're going to square the impedance. So in other words, if I take that, that CAT cable and if, if there was room enough in there and if I wrapped it through a second time, I would get four times the impedance. If I wrapped it through three times, I'd get nine times the impedance. So a lot of RFI problems get cured by multiple passes through a core. And that's the one thing that I tell hams is that typically one clamp on is not going to cure your problem. Wrap that thing through as many times as you can. That'll give you your best chance at, at fixing the problem. Another typical application we, we see as hams all the time is, is, our, is the one-to-one -one current ballot. Um, probably one of the most misunderstood pieces of ham radio equipment out there. I still remember the first, my first ham radio stations. I had a Heath kit DX60B. I had just got my general license and um, I hooked up my D104 mic to it. It's a metal mic. Very few mics today are metal. Got a nice little shock off the metal mic. Really realized after a long time that my, my feed line was radiating. The RF was coming down the shield back into the shack and everything metal in the shack was basically, I was going to get an RF burn off it. Of course, at 13 years old, I thought that was cool, but <laughs> you know, it would have been a lot better if I had uh, realized that a ballon would work. Ballons are easy to make. You take a, an FR31 or an FR43 core, you wind it. There are a million designs out there on the internet. Very easy to do. Uh, and it's probably the one of the easiest ham radio projects you can you can make. Very good at HF frequencies and works pretty much every time, no matter how you wind it. Ununs or impedance transformer. Um, I don't know. I I spent a lot of time making very simple RF transmitters. Um, there's a lot of great kits out there, uh, and a lot of times the uh, output from the transistor is anything but 50 ohms. So generally in a lot of the circuits, you'll see uh, basically an impedance matching a toroid that's wound to take maybe a 200 or 400, 400 ohm characteristic impedance coming out of, out of a MOSFET or IGBT to transform it to the, the 50, 50 ohms that your antenna wants to see. Also, too, a lot of, a lot of hams are right now experimenting with the NFED half wave antennas. Uh, you'll typically wind a nine to one transformer core uh, to match that impedance. Great use of, of a ferrite transformer core, very easy project. Again, tons of designs out there on the internet to get that done. And lastly, if you're building a power supply, um, again, all of our ferrite materials are available in standard core formations uh, so that you can, um, you can build your own power supply. We've, I think we pretty much talked about core losses. Uh, temperature, um, not going to come up too much in ham radio, but a lot of times we'll take a look at impedance graphs for different materials in suppression. We'll say, well, it's going to generate 400 ohms at 300 megahertz, and that ought to take care of my problem. That's true to a point. As temperature increases, and this is more, more applicable in industrial um, applications, as temperature increases, we have to derate the impedance. I can't really explain from a technical standpoint why that happens, but as temperature reaches the curie point, the amount of impedance that the core will, will generate drops off dramatically. So Ferry publishes a lot of graphs about derating it where we find this more most important today in my my business is in automotive with the advance with the event of of evs coming out on the market we're finding that that a lot of uh, circuit designers are placing our ferrite under the hood they're placing it in harsh environments and we're starting to see see this come into play where we're telling telling uh you know uh circuit designers that, hey, it might work in the lab, but once you put it out in the real world, it's not going to actually provide the impedance that you that you want. You know, all of our all of our graphs are published at room temperature and pressure, but at several hundred degrees centigrade, it may not work the way you intend it. Same thing with high DC components. Um, when I talk about high DC components, I'm talking about DC bias. Typical application for you might see in ham radio 
is you'll see a MOSFET amplifier. And off one of the MOSFET legs, you'll see a bead. That bead is, is there to absorb, uh, absorb EMI, uh, the switching components that that, um, you know, that that MOSFET is, 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 is generating. Well, it works well until you get a high DC bias. We're talking about many, many amps. Again, then ferrite will have to be derated. It basically swamps out that 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 ferrite material and really drops the uh, both the permeability and the impedance that that it's generating. N nothing real you can really do about it, but it has to be derated, and typically more ferrite need, needs to be added. Something that again probably is going to come up with in your in our thing, but you might take a look at like you know, especially in a, you know, today's generation of, of MOSFET amplifiers. And typically you'll see beads on those legs to try to absorb the MI. I guarantee that that circuit designer had to take that, those high DC components into consideration. So this is kind of where we, we fit in. Um, we make the manganese zinc ferrites and the nickel zinc ferrites. Um, Typically, lower in frequencies, the, the powdered and soft magnetic materials work better. Um, up at higher frequencies, again, the powdered cores and microwave ferrets work. We kind of work in that middle zone, basically in the kilohertz to gigahertz range. And that's kind of where ferrite products, what we make, fits into the magnetic spectrum. So we're just going to conclude here. Um, in power applications, ferrite, what we're looking for is low losses, high Curie temperatures, which will allow us to drive that to almost saturation and still maintain a flat temperature response. And in suppression, what we're looking for is we're looking for high losses. As the, as the frequency increases, we're looking for that ferrite to become highly resistant to absorb EMI. And lastly, just a summary, we make a lot of different grades of ferrite, and I can't stress this enough. I can't tell you how many ham fests I've been to, and I've seen bargain tables of hundreds of ferrites. Most of the time, I can tell you it's not even ferrite material. It's probably powdered magnetic. That's not a bad thing necessarily, but if you think that you're buying ferrite, make sure that you buy ferrite because and, and buy the grade you want. Um, also, we learned that uh, one material can be used as a different in different applications. At low frequencies, a certain ferrite might work great in a power application, but as the frequency increases, it becomes highly resistive. Works also as a EMI absorber. The more you know about the application, the better off you're going to be. Um, a lot of times, hands, especially hands, will come to me and say, "I have an EMI problem. How do I solve it?" I say, well, let's start by clamping on some ferrite. Do you know where the problem is? No, I don't. What do you, what do, what do you want to do? And they'll say, well, I want to clamp something on an interconnect cable. And I'll say, why don't we start by, you know, what's the switching frequency of the device that's causing the problem? And let's take a look at where, you know, where, what, what's the best material? It might be our 31 material, which operates over a wide frequency range, or maybe it's really high up in the megahertz range, almost to the gigahertz range, and our 61 material will work best. So the more you know about the problem, the easier it's going to be to solve. And I guess the last thing I wanted to just talk about is, again, something I already covered. Uh, <laughs> you're probably best off uh, avoiding piles of ferrites at HamFest. Unless you know, unless the whoever's selling it tells you or knows exactly what that material is, probably it, you're going to bring it home and it's not going to solve the problem or worse yet, it's going to make the problem worse. So a lot of times knowing what material is, is probably your best avenue because it's going to give you the best chance of solving the problem. And so I think that's what I have for you guys today. Um, and uh, I guess with that, I hopefully you're all with me still. I didn't put you to sleep. I just wanted to, you know, give you kind of a brief overview of what I've learned about ferrite in the last five years. And I guess with that, you know, we can talk about any questions you might have. Well, thanks very much there, Bruce. Uh, that was very informative. I think we've just, we've had one question already, and that's from Tony M0TZM. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, thanks for the informative pre 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 uh, present presentation. We'll get there eventually. 
In a world of cheap knockoff products, how do Fairite protect themselves? Bear in mind that these products' cores tend to all look the same and don't appear to have any branding. Yeah, here's a good here's a good example where we kind of differentiated ourselves is we started machining ferrites. Um, as the form factors got smaller and smaller, um, companies came to us and said, I can't get a snap in snap on under the hood of the car anymore. Um, I need a small piece that's this shape, this size, and I need 900 of them and I need them tomorrow. And what's what, the way we've differentiated ourselves is we, we, invested about $3 million in a machine shop. Ferrite is brittle. It is very hard to machine. So we educated ourselves about how, you know, it's basically a high spindle speed with the diamond bit, basically. And so we've, we've kind of made ourselves kind of like the, I guess the best way to put it is, is that while we maintain a standard list of standard form factors, we've also do a ton of custom work now. We find that's where the money is. That's where people want to pay. It's not ham radio. It's not where ham radio is, but this is probably the, the you know, we're, why we're still in business and why we're making product in the United States. Excellent, excellent. Um, from David Olin, he says, um, is there a standard color code? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to let you in on a, on a secret. There isn't. <laughs> and it's one of the biggest frustrations that I have. And I, I can only tell you that 98% of our market is not ham radio. It's, it's industrial electronics manufacturing. And because we use so much of the case, let's take snap it's for instance, that, that those are the products you're probably most familiar with. Uh, many of the hams come to us and say, can't you color code it? Can't you do this? And I'm just going to be on totally honest with you as a ham radio operator for the two to 3% that might go into the hobby market. What we call ham radio. It's hard for us to justify spending as much time and money color coding it. I, I wish the answer was different. I've kind of fought it internally, but it's just very hard to, it's very hard for us to, to justify the cost. There are ways to identify um, a ferrite. We have a video online done by one of my colleagues that talk about it using, you know, standard volt ohm meter and things like that. But quite frankly, it's not that easy to identify, say, a 61 mix from a 43 mix from a 31 mix. It's not that easy. It, it's just hard. And it's hard for us to kind of justify I would love it. Trust me, as a ham radio operator, I would have I would have done it the minute that I worked there. But it's we use a lot of the same cases on different materials, and it's it's really hard for us to do justify. Okay, there's another one here from uh, from Dave, and he says, "Can we fix Bob Hiles microphones and receive audio products less susceptible to EMI?" I think that's very <laughs> uh, that's a uh, that's a very confrontational uh, subject there, maybe, there, Dave. <laughs> you, you know, the, the interesting thing is, is uh, I had a Heil mic. I had a, you know, headset and thing. I didn't have any problems with it. I'm not aware of the Heil issue, but uh, I'm sure it, it can be. Um, <laughs> I'm sure it can be. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look a little bit more into it. Uh, but <laughs> I'm just laughing. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, Jesse has come up and says, I am making a vertical HF antenna for 40 to 20 metres with a 240-43 type toroid with eight, co co oh, eight coils, I presume, eight, uh, eight, well, single coil with eight uh, turns, be a suitable RF choke. Yeah, I, again, our 43 material and our 31 material will both work really well um for for that application um probably recommend yeah 43 44 would probably be the best um and uh, you know we we'll, we'll, we make a number of toroids and 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 the like that will work just fine for that application right right and i presume the number of turns you probably find with experiment to some extent yeah and it, it you know there's nothing it's interesting in hf especially in 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 that kind of design I find there's nothing new under the sun. 
if you dig deep enough back in a handbook from 1940, whatever, you're going to find it. It's just, um, it's just finding it exactly. Uh, but. Oh yeah. So I've got one from Wayne here. Are the tables you supplied, uh, available online? I believe, well, we have the copy, don't we? So. Yeah, you have the copy. Um, but yeah, everything that I've shared is basically from our catalog. Our catalog's available online. We stopped printing this year our 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 final written, you know, printed catalog. Otherwise, I'd send you guys some. Um, it just became to the point, got to the point where nobody wanted it anymore, except guys my age. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I travel a lot for, you know, for sales and, and for my company. And I got to the point where dealing with 24 year old engineers, I'd hand them a catalog and they'd hand it back to me. They'd take a look at me and say, what do you do? Why, why would you give this to me? <laughs> Isn't it available online? But everything I've, I've shown you is available online. All right. Excellent. Excellent. I'm going to um, hopefully if we can uh, ask people to unmute and uh, ask any questions they care to ask. We've got a few uh, people on board who've been, uh, oh, we go. Pete asks, where do they source mater their materials from? But I think you actually make are they your materials predominantly. Is that right? We make, a. am going gonna, I'm gonna to guess at the percentage, about 30 to 40% of our own powders. Uh, there are other powders, um, especially say the 61 material that we have to buy. Uh, the powders uh, come both domestically and in Asia. So it, it's multiple, multiple source. We're very careful about sourcing powders. It takes a long time to qualify a company uh, for, for powder manufacturing if it's not one of our powders. Consistency is everything in this business. And uh, because we, like a lot of other industries out there, um, are competitive in terms of, you know, uh, these powders can be used in a number of different applications. So we compete in the market for them, yep. just like everybody else. And frankly, if you turn your back for a few minutes, you know, the quality goes to zero. So you have to be very careful and, uh, you know, about what you accept. We get it from all over the world and we make our own powders. Excellent, excellent. Right, any more questions? I'm going to open it up. Anyone wish to unmute themselves and uh, ask something there? I can see uh, Paul, G8AQA. Maybe I'm interested in some of the power magnetics, possibly. I don't think you have anything in the way of questions, John. It's uh, Heather here. Thanks for a very good talk, Bruce. One of the best ones I've been to for a while. So, uh, and very informative. I'm going to definitely go and have a look at your catalogue. Great. Yeah, we're, no, we're, glad, we're, glad you enjoy it. I'm, I, again, I'm just a sales guy. You know, I, <laughs> I, it's a, not 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 electrical engineer. Not a you know. We've got guys at our plant that you know know tons more. But from a ham radio perspective, I've I've you know wanted to share with as many people as I can just what I've you know the simple things I've learned over the past five years and uh right now i'm kind of like in a emi consulting uh application for my company kind of just broadcasting the world you know what we can do for them thanks very much uh from anybody from anyone else i was going to say we're actually sitting in our car at the moment uh, because we went to another meeting and came out a bit early to hear the talk thanks very much thank you thank you and, and Dave says, is there a talk next month? And uh, yes, there should be a talk. And that would be with uh, hopefully Hans Summers. All right, I'll stop the recording now.